Rarely has Australia had such a vicious predator as the murderer in this program, a brute so notorious he would go down in our annals of crime. Peter Norris Dupas terrorised women for over 40 years, beginning at an early age. Eventually, his crimes would escalate into some of the most horrendous murders Australia has ever seen. Now, the painstaking detective work to bring this killer to justice captivated the country with its many twists and turns. I'm Stan Grant, and this is Crimes That Shook Australia. For more than four decades, one of Australia's most prolific serial killers, Peter Norris Dupas, preyed on the women of Victoria. He's driven by dark demons and compulsions we can't even imagine. This guy is pure evil. His eyes, his demeanour, the way he planned it all. By 2010, three innocent women lay dead at his hands in the most macabre killings the country had ever seen. She had been stabbed multiple times. She was semi-naked. Developing sadistic rituals that would stun the nation. It's the first murder I'd attended and was something I hadn't seen before, there being post-mortem mutilations. But for years, he would evade the necessary justice for his crimes. He can rot in hell, that's all I want to say. Only to be finally brought down in one of Australia's most sensational trials involving a jailhouse confession and a million dollar reward, making this a crime that shook Australia. Peter Norris Dupas began his reign of terror over 40 years ago, when he was still just a boy. Dupas first came to police attention as a 15-year-old, where he attacked uh, his neighbour. Attempting to stab his victim with a kitchen knife, this terrifying method would become a chilling part of his sexual attacks for many years to come, culminating in three innocent women meeting a horrific fate. You are a psychopath driven by the hatred of women. When 28-year-old Nikki Patterson failed to meet her friend one evening, nobody could have predicted the horror that was to unfold. The original job of being called in as a suicide by a girlfriend of Nikki Patterson that turned up to go out for dinner with Nikki. Uh, so it had been called in as a suicide, but when the van crew attended and also the local detectives, it became very evident to them that it wasn't a suicide and um, that uh, Nikki had been murdered and also mutilated. Police sealed off Harper Street just after 7 o'clock last night when a friend of Nicole Amanda Patterson found her body slumped inside the Northcote house. A trained psychotherapist and counsellor, Nikki Patterson lived in Northcote, Melbourne. There's a lot of aspects of Nikki. I guess firstly, she was a rogue. She was a, a bit of a rascal growing up and uh, she just loved life and uh, loved people. Nikki was at a, a, I think, a perfect point in her life. She discovered what she wanted to do and who she was. Prior to that, I think she was trying a number of aspects and uh, found exactly where she wanted to head. Nikki was keen to choose a career that involved helping other people. She then joined Ardoc Youth Foundation, which was uh, making sure that underprivileged children received an education. And part of that was housing and, uh, if necessary, and uh, clothing and food. She wanted to utilise her psychotherapy qualification and start helping people with counselling. So she cut down to a seven day fortnight. Nikki took the decision to set up her own business with a view to building her clients. As a first step, she placed an advert in her local newspaper. 
we'll speak to the um, to the family. And we started to get the picture together, in fact, that she had just started a career as a psychotherapist, uh, and that would appear to be the first day. Confronted with a scene of carnage in Nikki's home, officers began their investigations into what could have happened and were quickly given telling clues. When we started to do the door knocks uh, in the area, uh, it became quite um, evident that something had occurred that morning. There are a number of um, witnesses indicated that they'd heard uh, arguments, loud arguments and, and um, screaming of a female, uh, but thought it was just a domestic dispute. We put so. That sort of gave us a bit of a timeline in relation to what we thought might have occurred. Uh, that sort of started our point of reference, and then from there we, um, you know, we started to piece everything together. The murder scene was to hold vital clues for Jeff Ma and his team. She had been stabbed multiple times. She was semi-naked. She'd been mutilated. And it was obvious to us that there was a, a, a sense of some sort of formal meeting of someone because of the tray and the coffee and the plunger and the jug of milk. And the room at the front of the house was set up like a, a consulting room or some sort of professional room. Having established her new business from home, it looked like Nikki was preparing for a client when tragedy struck. We determined we thought that it was in fact probably a client of hers, and that was indication by the relatives. We looked at all the evidence uh, at the time uh, in the house, and we were drawn towards a diary, and in that diary was the word Malcolm and a, and a mobile or a cell phone number. This diary entry and telephone number were now a major part of the investigation. Who was Malcolm? And what connection did he have to Nikki Patterson? It was actually owned by a Indian student. He was alibied. And in fact, um, he couldn't give us and help us anymore. So we made some inquiries in relation to the phone numbers that had been um, ringing Nikki Patterson's house. Uh, and we were able to show that, in fact, another phone number had rung the house, and that phone number was of Peter Dupas. Peter Dupas was a 46-year-old local man who lived in Pasco Vale. Checks were quickly made to discover if he had any previous dealings with police. We did a profile on Peter Dupas, and we discovered that, in fact, that he, had, he was a serial, um, violent predator against women. The telephone number at Dupass's address had called Nikki's home 15 times over 40 days. Officers wasted no time in tracking him down for questioning. We decided that uh, we had uh, enough to arrest him. We grabbed him uh, and uh, he was um, interviewed and we noticed that on his face for, uh, was a scratch and the scratcher uh, to us seemed to us that it looked like it possibly come from a human nail or, or striking of a nail down a face. Nikki had met a violent and horrific death. The scratch may have looked suspicious, but the detectives needed more. We asked him whether he'd, uh, he knows Nikki Patterson, whether he in fact had ever been a Harper Street in Northcote. Uh, that, you know, had he ever contacted Nikki Patterson and, and there was a negative response to all those uh, questions. He appeared uh, calm. He appeared sort of... Uh, uh, I'll describe him as a bit of a poindexter, a bit of a... Um, a bit of a blamange, a bit of a bay sort of person uh, that seemed to be emotionless. With little cooperation from Dupas, Jeff and his team rushed to search his home and were confronted with startling evidence. As we walked in to the yard, we saw that the uh, garden hose 
of the house had been repaired with yellow electrical tape. Now, the relevance of that was because there was small amounts of yellow electrical tape found at the scene in and upon Nicky Patterson's body. So it was very relevant to us. In the, the, uh, the rubbish bin at Peter Chipass's home address when we executed the search warrant, there was a small piece of paper that had been torn up and found at the bottom of his bin and putting it back together, it actually had Nicky's details and the appointment time and location on the bit of paper. And it had the word Malcolm written on it and that was the word and the name of the person that was next to that mobile phone number in her diary for that Monday morning at about nine o'clock. Down the bottom of the bin was also a pair of shoes which um, uh, had blood on the shoes. We found a um, kit, we'd call it, with a balaclava and some gloves and some condoms. And then further than that, we also then found a jacket, what you describe as a trucker's jacket, and it had what a, a appeared to us to be blood on the jacket. We further found a, a newspaper under the sink that had a cut through the face of Nikki Patterson which was a headline that she'd been uh, brutally murdered. Within just three days of Nikki's violent death, Victoria Police arrested and charged Dupas with her murder. He gave an alibi at the time that he just sort of filled the vehicle up, he pottered around, do it, did a few odd jobs, and his girlfriend was away at the time, and he didn't attend work that day, so he really didn't have an alibi. Whatever alibi Dupas was to provide, the scientific evidence was to prove overwhelming. The jacket was important because on the jacket there was a DNA profile of not only Nicky Patterson on the jacket, but also of Peter Dupas and a combination. We discovered afterward as well, uh, when we collected all the CCTV in the area, that in fact that morning before he murdered Nicky Patterson, he filled his motor vehicle up with uh, fuel at a local service station and on the CCTV you see him paying for the fuel uh, in that green jacket. The evidence against this vicious predator was now compelling. After a trial lasting four weeks, the verdict came through. Peter was sentenced to life imprisonment without parole, which was a great relief to the police and the family um, who were there every day throughout the trial and remained very strong. I suppose I felt relief when they caught him. I, I think I was too shocked to feel anger. I was sort of more saying, he's stolen her, he's a thief. He's stolen my daughter. My family's not whole anymore. They have got the right person, and I wasn't ever in doubt that they didn't have. Well, they just just have him off the street and um, that he would be uh, punished for the rest of his life. Peter Dupas was behind bars, but the tragic murder of Nicky Patterson was just the beginning of an insight into this killer's reign of terror. What was to follow would stun the nation. Dupas, to us, was a violent sexual predator against women. It was quite obvious to us that Nicky Patterson's murder wasn't his first. The macabre murder of a young woman at her home here in Northcote has led police to Peter Norris Dupas, a sadistic predator who stalks his unsuspecting victims. Now, as officers close the case on Nicole Patterson and Dupas starts his sentence, they discover that this is only the start of things to come. When we started to probe Rand in relation to who he was, there was a substantial police file on him. This police file dated right the way back to the early 1970s. I was at Nunawading CIB and uh, we got a call to attend a place in Mitcham where there was a complaint of a, uh, a woman who had been raped. She was at home when I knock at the door and uh, she answered to see this uh, person who said his car had broken down and uh, perhaps if he could have the lend of a screwdriver that he might be able to fix it. She went off to get the screwdriver and the, 
he came in and grabbed her around the, the neck. Just days later, the attacker struck again nearby. This particular one, he'd gone to the front door and used exactly the same scenario, that my car's broken down, the bonnet was up again, could I use a, have a screwdriver? The woman there was perhaps a little bit more suspicious. She said to him, well, my husband's coming home shortly. Perhaps if you wait, he can help you fix the car. And with that, of course, he said, oh, don't worry about it. It'll be right, sort of thing. And he left immediately over to his car, closed the bonnet, drove off. She got the car number. With a pattern emerging, a description of a man and a car to go off, Ian Armstrong closed in on a suspect, 21-year-old Peter Dubas. He had his hands clenched together and he'd sort of be looking down as though trembling and we thought, I thought, this guy's going to crack, you know. Uh, he, uh, he looked as though he was just about on the verge of saying, OK, you got me, sort of thing. And then he'd just sort of look up and, no, I don't know what you're saying. Not me, I wasn't there. It was as though he just, his whole persona changed, and uh, which was quite strange. I'd never come across a person like this. I thought to myself, this guy's different. He's very much different to anybody I'd encountered. Despite Dupas's denial, his victim successfully identified him in a lineup, a turning point that would see Dupas put behind bars for the first time. He ended up uh, being convicted of the offence and being sentenced to nine years imprisonment. I said that his the cold, calculating way he went about it, the eyes, everything, it all rolled into one to me, saying this guy is evil, and I, in my opinion, has the ability, where, especially where females are concerned, to go all the way and to uh, to kill. A chilling warning from a detective decades before that was to sadly come true. A young Peter Dupas first went to prison in 1974, 25 years before the murder of Nicky Patterson. On his release, he committed four attacks on separate women over 10 days in 1979, three further assaults in 1980, another rape just four days after release in 1985, and the false imprisonment of a woman in 1994. What we're able to establish by looking into his criminal history is he was a man who was a repeat offender, showed no remorse, and I suspect couldn't even help himself. Shockingly, despite a lifetime behind bars for killing Nicky Patterson, Australia would be plagued by Dupas's heinous crimes for years to come. We started to investigate previous murders that maybe he fitted the bill with. And that's why a task force was formed. Paul Scarlett went to the task force and they investigated the murder of uh, Margaret Ma. Margaret Ma had been murdered in 1997 and her case remained unsolved. Homicide detectives are investigating the discovery of a woman's body in Somerton. Margaret lived in the Campbell Field area and was well known for uh, applying her trade as a prostitute. She was described as a, a fairly harmless woman who was only working uh, enough for the purpose of uh, being able to supply uh, a drug addiction. She was well liked uh, in the area, being that she was just a, uh, a softly spoken, very quiet lady, and would often um, be seen at the shopping centre, just walking around the shops, selecting items off the shelf, and then putting them back. I think that was Margaret's way of just some degree of normalcy in her life. And then from there, she would go out and, and continue to work. 40-year-old Margaret Ma's life took a turn for the worse as she entered her adult years. Margaret came from a very successful family, a very close-knit family. Margaret was certainly a, a, a character as a, a teenager and in her later years started to run into a little bit of bad luck, mainly because of the people she was associating with at the time. Margaret worked the streets to feed her drug addiction and in 1997, 
tragedy struck. Margaret's body was located in Summerton at about 6.30 in the morning by a man and his wife who were collecting cans to raise funds for a charity, I believe. And uh, he saw the pile of computer components and boxes lying in that area and lifted one of them and found Margaret's body underneath. Margaret had been choked to death, mutilated, and had one of her breasts removed. But despite many police hours, the investigation into her horrific murder ran cold. There was no new information coming forward. And the difficulty was, because of Margaret's um, past behaviour and her lifestyle, she was a prostitute, she was a, a drug user, her health was not good, she had some issues um, health-wise. So the investigators initially couldn't take it anywhere and the, the investigation was filed. But more than seven years on from her murder, officers would uncover a terrifying link to Nikki Patterson that would blow the case wide open again. There were, were only two murders recorded in Australia in the last uh, 10 years where breasts had been removed post-mortem, and that was Nicole Patterson, which Peter had already been convicted for, and Margaret Ma. The violent death of Margaret Marr in Somerton in 1997 devastated her family and puzzled police. Despite extensive investigations, the trail of her killer has ended up running cold. Yet years later, with the violent death of another woman, Nikki Patterson, officers would find themselves back on the hunt for Margaret's killer after a chilling discovery that linked both women. The injuries sustained to her were very similar to Nikki. In fact, so similar, when we started to review that investigation, we went to the Homicide Monitoring Unit in Canberra, and I gave them parameters of, of searching murders nationally, and I think it was the figures were up around the 2 in 10,000 murders nationally that had similar wounds inflicted. The two in 10,000 were Nikki and Margaret. This bizarre mutilation had only happened to these two women. It was so rare, it led only to one man, Peter Dupas. But detectives needed to build the case further. When Margaret's body was located, there were a number of boxes and computer components that were uh, tipped on top of the body. So obviously a lot of that was re-examined and uh, there was also a female's glove located nearby and that was tested back in 1997 with the technology that was available then and we had that glove retested in uh, 2001 and at that time the uh, scientists lifted DNA from inside one of the finger holes of the glove. This DNA was a massive breakthrough and matched with their prime suspect, Dupas. The chances of it belonging to anyone else were one in 450,000. We used the DNA evidence and similar fact evidence to uh, complete a, a brief of evidence uh, against Peter Dupas. Our argument was that the person that did this was one and the same person as the person that had murdered uh, Nicole Patterson because we said he had uh, a signature. Um, that is the removal of the breast or breasts in the case of Nicole Patterson. We need an unusual feature um, or an un underlying methodology or practice, um, and we had that. The argument against Dupas appeared to be mounting, but in opening the case once more, it also reopened wounds for Nikki Patterson's family. We had to suspend Margaret's trial and effectively reopen Nicole's murder trial and prove that murder to this jury. It was extremely hard, the Margaret Ma trial. During the trial for Nikki, I was in too much shock and I sat out on a lot of the parts that were going to be too hard. But this time I sat there and, uh, and made most of it. There was one instance where they showed video of Nikki in her lounge room and 
when they panned around onto her face and her eyes were open, I just walked straight out. You know, it was pretty horrific. The eventual trial for the murder of Margaret Ma was heard seven years after her death. Despite the evidence against him, Dupas still mounted a defence. The defence mentioned uh, that breast mutilation or genital mutilation was a common event during the Vietnam War and with Jack the Ripper. So their defence was that it was not an unusual event and shouldn't be considered as uh, a unique set of circumstances here in Australia. After a highly charged trial lasting three weeks, the verdict came through. Peter Dupas was again sentenced to life imprisonment without parole for the murder of Margaret Ma. We felt relieved uh, for the family. Dupas was now known as one of Australia's most barbaric killers. His depravity held no bounds, taking one of Nicky's body parts after his chilling attack and leaving Margaret with her breast forced into her mouth. With his crimes recorded from the age of just 15, his macabre attacks had escalated over the years, culminating in two horrific murders. With such a history, could there be more victims? Well, it was All Saints Day, and Messina had gone out uh, in her boyfriend's car to the cemetery uh, to tend to her, uh, her grandmother's grave. Messina Hal Vargas was a 25-year-old bank worker who lived in Mentone with her parents. Messina was a lovely young girl who lived a very, um, I'd say, modest life, um, very respectful young girl. On the afternoon of Saturday, the 1st of November, Messina took the decision to go to Faulkner Cemetery, a vast graveyard in the suburbs of Melbourne. Having bought flowers nearby, she made her way to the Greek Orthodox section. A slightly built, fragile um, woman tending her grandmother's grave and, uh, you know, doing the right thing, doing the family responsibility and, do, you know, doing the, the right and the moral thing. As Messina knelt down to tend her grandmother's grave, the unthinkable happened. She was attacked viciously and repeatedly near the grave, uh, murdered, dragged up into an area between two graves and uh, left there. Masuna had been reported missing by uh, her boyfriend and her father and eventually the trail led back to the cemetery where the vehicle was located uh, the boyfriend's vehicle was located and the scene was discovered. When she failed to return in her fiancé's car, he and his father went to investigate and found the vehicle still parked at the cemetery. Messina sustained a brutal and frenzied attack, suffering more than 80 stab wounds throughout her body, with such a violent and what appeared to be senseless attack. News quickly spread throughout the community as police tried to catch her murderer. So far, there are no clues to the motive for the killing. And we're not discounting the fact that it was a random attack. It was huge media interest uh, because of the circumstances and the, and the style of murder. We had to track whether or not there was anything in the background of Messina that uh, could take us down a path of, uh, of issues specifically relating to her, and that, that wasn't the case. Before long, information started to flood in. On the days leading up to the murder, we had a number of women um, that uh, made statements in relation to being approached by a person, and uh, it showed that he was in the cemetery and stalking these women was lucky that they weren't victims uh, of the particular crime that unfortunately fell upon uh, Messina. During that first uh, period at the crime scene, a lady came forward and, and provided 
a face fit identification diagram. We had it, but it didn't take us any further. The lady, Mrs. Berman, mentioned a man she had spoken to in the cemetery on the same day as the murder. Acting strangely, she made a note of what he looked like and what he wore, but officers needed more. Over the coming months, Victoria Police would gather over a thousand statements and interview anybody who might help with their investigation. But this was all to no avail. Our investigations kept going on that, but we weren't having any breakthrough. This frustration, coupled with no forensic evidence for Greg and his team to go off, meant they were no closer to finding out who had attacked Messina and why. Seven years on from Messina's murder, Paul Scarlett and his colleagues had just put the killer of Margaret Ma behind bars. We then commenced uh, looking into Messina's case, trying to open up other avenues of inquiry which hadn't yet been explored or properly developed. There were hundreds of information reports created by people trying to assist police. Many exhibits were taken from the Faulkner Cemetery, cigarette butts, tyre impressions, uh, prints, samples, witnesses being spoken to, re-canvassed, door knocks conducted, media releases. The hunt for Messina's killer was once again a major focus for Victoria Police, with the government even stepping in with one of the highest rewards ever offered in the country. In February 2005, the Victorian government released a $1 million reward for any information leading to the capture and uh, conviction of the personal persons responsible for the murder. This massive financial commitment was pushed with the determination of Messina's family, especially her father, George. Originally, there was a $50,000 reward offered in the case of her murder, but uh, George turned himself into a one-man lobby group and he went to the government and he got 100,000 and finally, ultimately, a million. With the case now firmly back in the public conscious, the investigation was to take a surprising turn. There was a turning point when the reward money was released as a result of uh, a couple of witnesses coming forward. That and also uh, making contact with a man called Andrew Fraser. Andrew Fraser was the underworld's lawyer of choice for many years. He was a hard man for hard jobs. Andrew Fraser, who was a disgraced lawyer at the time, doing time for drug trafficking, uh, and he had in fact done time with and, and being in prison with uh, Peter Jupas. Andrew Fraser was on my list of people to contact and uh, I left him till last because I really didn't think I'd get any joy. But to my surprise, when I did contact him, he said, you better come and see me. After receiving two life sentences for the murders and mutilation of Nikki Patterson and Margaret Ma, Peter Norris Dupas was considered one of Australia's most dangerous men. Yet despite the convictions, Victoria Police still had unanswered questions. Here at the Faulkner Cemetery in the suburbs of Melbourne, Messina Halvagas was visiting her grandmother's grave when she was viciously attacked and left for dead. Despite a seven-year investigation, police were no closer to finding her killer. And then they received a surprising lead from somewhere they'd never expected. Andrew Fraser was one of Australia's top criminal defence lawyers, but convicted of smuggling cocaine, found himself face to face with Dupas in prison. Andrew Fraser was sentenced to six years imprisonment, and that's where Peter Dupas was being housed at that time. Andrew made contact with Peter, uh, particularly Peter, because he was the one that he feared the most and uh, he wanted to um, have Peter on site. Fraser obviously had something to say. Could he provide the missing link officers had been searching for? I left Melbourne that night and spoke to Andrew Fraser in person at the prison the very next morning. Paul Scarlett could never have imagined what was to follow. 
Andrew alleges that there was one occasion when he and Peter were walking around the garden area of the uh, prison and a prisoner from another area approached the cyclone fence and yelled obscenities to Peter saying, you killed my cousin Messina. And Peter's responded in a rather colourful way and then turned around to, uh, to Fraser and said, how does that so-and-so know what I've done? When they were in the garden working and Fraser has allegedly dug up a knife or a shiv in the garden area and shown it to Peter and Peter has uh, held the knife in his hands, almost balanced the knife in his hands and mentioned the word Messina or the name Messina uh, on a couple of occasions and um, has then got rid of the knife. In one particular meeting that uh, Andrew Fraser had with Peter, he was discussing the prosecution case or the brief that uh, I had served on him in jail for the murder of Margaret Ma. And Fraser argued with Jip Hass about the DNA that police had found inside the glove and, in, and uh, Fraser said, you told me there was no DNA left at the scene. And they then got onto the discussion about uh, Messina Hill Vargas' crime scene and Jip Hass responded by saying, I left no DNA at that scene. Andrew Fraser was providing the police with explosive information and more was to come. Fraser spent a significant time with Peter in his cell talking about general matters and on one occasion when they were watching television, George Hell Vargas was making a public plea for Jip Hass to talk to police and on this occasion Jip Hass uh, clamped both of his hands together and started staring into space, rocking backwards and forwards and Fraser asked him what was wrong and Jip Hass then um, turned off the television. He actually mined the murder, showing himself um, creeping up on somebody and stabbing them in a way that only the police would know was actually right. This flood of new information could have been the turning point officers desperately needed. It had been eight years since Messina's death and had cost thousands of man hours. Now they were potentially one step closer to connecting Dupas to the murder. I was absolutely relieved uh, to get that information from Andrew Fraser and I, I knew that uh, that's all we needed to go to court. We had enough. But the offer of this priceless information came with a condition. Andrew agreed to uh, give this information as evidence in court only on the condition that he was released from prison. I did what's called a petition of mercy to the state government to, uh, to try and get Andrew Fraser out of prison so that I could commence the trial for Messina Hill Vargas. It took Scarlett over a year to get Fraser out of prison, but once he was a free man, it was time to go to court. Andrew Fraser was released from prison at about 5.30 uh, one particular morning and by uh, 10 o'clock that morning I was charging Jipass with murder. Can you tell me please your full name and address? Peter Norris Jipass, Bowen Prison. Peter was surprised to see me but just made a no comment interview and uh, wouldn't cooperate. I put it to you that uh, Messina was stabbed to death whilst tending to the Faulkner Cemetery in Melbourne. Do you know the incident that I'm talking about? Yeah, okay. Paul and I spoke to George Helvargs and the family about it, that we were in fact charging Dupas with the murder. It was a pretty good day for the Helvargs family and a, a, a pretty good day for us. One of the most highly anticipated trials in Australian criminal history was to get underway at the Supreme Court in Melbourne. And Andrew Fraser was to be one of the key witnesses. I did everything I could to corroborate the information that uh, Andrew Fraser gave to me through prison records of uh, including prisoner movement. And I was able to do that to a degree. But the pantomime, obviously, I'm never going to be able to, uh, to prove that to a court. In July 2007, a packed court heard the evidence presented by Andrew Fraser as he acted out what Dupas had done in prison, or the pantomime. Other crucial witnesses also took the stand. 
Mrs Berman made a photo fit. We were challenged that uh, it was made up, but bearing in mind that Mrs Berman made that face identification in early 1998, and we didn't get those photos of Peter Dupas into our possession until April 1999. So there's absolutely no way that the allegations put to us could have ever occurred. Another vital part of the jigsaw was now available. Dupas's jacket, found with Nicky's blood on, matched a description Mrs Berman had given in the cemetery years before, strongly suggesting he wore it during both murders. The defence for Dupas questioned the evidence, even arguing that Messina's fiancé could have harmed her. All the while, the killer, now in court for a third murder, sat giving nothing away. Dupas always has the same attitude in court. He will just sit there silent, staring straight ahead. Occasionally, he will glare at somebody. After a tense 22-day trial, the verdict was announced. He was convicted. He received life no minimum for the murder of Messina. It was just a great sense of relief for the Helvargas family and the Patterson family that were there every day with uh, the Helvargas's. Just a great sense of relief. I think just being there and for them knowing that I, I understand how they feel, well, I don't think I ever will understand because I had three days of not knowing. They had 10 years before it went to trial. Dupas had finally been handed the justice he had long deserved, but this victory was to be short-lived. Dupas appealed the conviction on the basis of reliability and credibility of witnesses that had identified Dupas from the front pages of the, uh, the local newspapers. Uh, and also um, the defence raised the issue that they didn't believe Dupas could ever get a fair trial because of the media notoriety of, of his crimes and uh, his, his history, criminal history. To many people's disbelief, the appeal was upheld. This devastating blow meant the guilty verdict for Messina's murder was quashed. We just devastated, that's it. A decision that shocked the nation. A retrial was ordered, meaning police, family and witnesses had to endure the legal process once more. With the first uh, Messina Helvagas trial, I was not involved in the prosecution of that. But essentially, in the second prosecution, we relied on the same evidence in the main. But witnesses once again took to the stand, along with Andrew Fraser, who recounted what Dupas had done in prison. He's jumped up and gone like that, pointing at the wall. And I'm sitting here, so he's turned around and then he indicated himself, and then he started the flailing motion as if stabbing somebody. The retrial lasted 26 days. He was convicted again, and he appealed. That appeal was knocked back. Dupas will now spend the rest of his days in jail where he belongs. The family were very much looking forward to spending their Christmas together for the first time since Messina's tragic death with this issue now behind them. Andrew Fraser has now received some of the $1 million reward. Quite frankly, he deserves it because the Director of Public Pr Prosecution said that without him, there would have been no trial and therefore no conviction. The infamous Reign of Terror by Peter Norris Dupas has spanned four decades, cost thousands of police hours and much heartache for victims and their families. He will spend the rest of his life behind bars. The judge said the question remained of how did Dupas come to be how he is. His actions were not explained by mental illness, drugs, childhood or other trauma, but driven by a deep-seated hatred of women. But despite some closure for Nikki, Margaret and Messina's families, it isn't the end.
We believe he's the suspect in a, a number of other murders uh, going back to the uh, early 80s. Helen McMahon at the uh, Rye Back Beach in the 80s was murdered and we believe he's a person of interest in that. The Kathleen Downs murder at a nursing home at Brunswick and also the murder of uh, Renita Brunton uh, who was killed in a uh, clothing store in uh, Sunbury. Peter Dupass is the criminal who won't go away. Seen a lot of homicides and charged a lot of offenders, but can I tell you that Dupass is uh, a very, very evil person. I'm no expert on the conscience of Peter Dupass, but I suspect he hasn't got one. Will he ever confess? I suspect not. You can't even get any sense of what's going on in his head. The, the corners of evil in his mind are just beyond comprehension. He's driven by things he doesn't even understand. So he's in jail to punish him, not really. It won't stop him. It's to protect us. The name Peter Norris Dupas will forever remain etched in the minds of the victims, families and officers of those who had the misfortune of having him enter their lives. Despite the small comfort of knowing he'll spend the rest of his life behind bars, police are still working tirelessly to see if this callous killer can be linked to any other unsolved murders. Until these crimes are resolved, there can truly not be closure. I'm Stan Grant. Please join me next time for Crimes That Shook Australia.